Excellent. Well, first off, I'm Tony. I'm a social worker with Parkinson's Resources of Oregon here in Portland. And thank you folks for all coming today. Whenever I get to speak in front of a room full of experts, I feel very blessed. So thank you for allowing me to do that today. So I hope you've read our bios. I think they're on page 22, because I'm not going to repeat them. But in order to know our panelists a little bit better, I'm going to ask each of them a question before we go to you folks for questions. So first of all, Julie, how have you personally dealt with worsening non-motor symptoms in your loved one? Um, for me, it's, uh, I have a, just a little bit of background, a husband who was diagnosed at 35 and is now 50. So for 15 years, I've watched kind of the slow progression or regression of his um, non-motor. And I was telling someone in the group, I think it was for me probably the hardest thing to deal with. But I've learned to adapt and to kind of slow my pace down, which is fairly feverish, with three kids uh, that we raised and a full-time job. So I brought this up here to, this is one of the tools I use is a book like this um, at home and I write a list every morning for my husband to give him a reminder of what needs to be done. It accomplishes a couple of things. One is um, makes him feel useful. He's no longer working, can no longer drive. So he's fairly homebound. Uh, he can still walk, but with falls. And so, um, you know, we need to make sure he's staying as active as possible. Another thing I've done is um, we use a lot of phone technology and set reminders for things. And, you know, again, it, I really have to remind myself because I go from a working world, which is very busy and a lot to think about and manage, along with three teenagers, to him who's at a very different pace. Um, I also have a golden retriever who's a little hyperactive, so... <laughs> Uh, there's a lot going on in our house, so um, it's really just stepping back and taking time to make sure he understands. I'm not always the best at it. I try to be patient, um, but those are some of the tools that I use. Thank you. We're going to move on to Rick. Rick, how, uh, how have you managed end-of-life discussions with your loved one and your family? Uh, so my father uh, passed at the beginning of this year um, after almost 10 years with Parkinson's. He was a confounded patient. He had uh, some cancers as well. Um, I remember uh, he really wanted to come down and visit, but didn't have, he was in Seattle and I was in the Bay Area. He didn't have the energy to do it. And he said, you know, as soon as I shake this thing, I'll, I'll come down and see you. And I thought it was kind of important for me to, to mention to him then, uh, by the way, I, I took, once he was diagnosed, not long after I started working in the Parkinson's industry for a while. Um, so I knew something about the disease, and I, I said, you know, today is the worst you've ever felt, and it's the best you're ever going to feel again. So if you're going to do something that you got left on your list, do it today and not next week. My sister and I took him uh, uh, back to where he grew up in Pennsylvania. Uh, but that was kind of his last traveling trip. And, um, you know, I think his generation's a little stoic and didn't really want to talk about end-of-life stuff. You know, he's always going to get back on his feet and whatnot. Um, I don't think that really served him that well, to be honest. Um, but it was his way of coping with it. And as the outsider, it's really, you know, he has to do it his way, and there's not a whole lot you can do. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Pat, as a caregiver, how did you manage, um, how should we put it, judgment by others? Judgment by others. Uh, just a little background. My husband is... Uh, so, okay. Uh, my husband was diagnosed for, okay, can you hear me now? My husband was <laughs> diagnosed 14 years ago at the age of 68. Uh, he has no tremor. His, his symptoms were that he couldn't get out of a chair and that w when he went to see the neurologist from the advice of his family doctor, they found out that he did not have enough dopamine. So his is a different kind of Parkinson's than a lot of it. But anyway, uh, as we went through the process of, of all, all of the... Uh, uh, living with this for this 14 years, you find that lots of people will stop on the street and they'll be all over the patient saying how wonderful he looks, et cetera, et cetera, but they totally ignore the caregiver. And so I felt uh, 
I had an opportunity to give a paper for, with the group that I belonged to this past spring, and I had something lighter in mind, but decided with what we were working with at that time, the best thing to do was to tell our story, because if I tell our story, then we get the facts out there. If you leave it to somebody else, you don't. So I wrote a paper called The Crisis of Caregiving, in which I shared three different stories, two which had been published elsewhere that other people had had happen to them, and the last one was ours, and how things had changed over the 14 years. And that helped a lot. And I ended it by saying that uh, when you see a well-dressed patient out in the, out in the, the, uh, in the world, you know, at, at the doctor's office or at your local grocery store or at church, don't just assume they got there on their own. They got there with a lot of help. And, and oh, by the way, when you see the caregiver with them, give them a hug. You know, the, the patient likes it, but the caregiver needs it more. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go to questions from you folks. But first, I want to get the questions on the table. Vaughn here is going to come up and get those questions up onto the screen. So what I'm looking for, I'm going to pull this out of here. What I'm looking for is two questions for each panelist. So, right, wait for the microphone. There she is. Oh. So this would be one question for you, Julie. I'm curious, what were some of the what are some of the items you put on your husband's daily list? Okay, so let's get let's get another question for any panelist. Right back there. I forgot the name, but the man <laughs> in the middle. Rick. <laughs> yeah. Um, explain how your how your dad seemed to be. I don't remember the phrasing you used, but kind of in, in denial or not accepting it all the way or that he was going to get back. I would just like to hear how that manifested itself some. Okay. Good question. Another question? Right here. Uh, this one is also for Julie about the list. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if uh, she has to incorporate scheduling into the list for her husband or if she's able to keep it simple. Okay. So do we have three questions? Three more? One more from somebody? Ah, good. I'm, I'm not sure who to address this to, but I'm only two years in, my husband's only two years into his diagnosis, so we're early in this process. and. I wonder if there's anything you wish you had done early on that you didn't do as advice for me. Is it okay if we give that to Pat? That's okay. okay. Two more questions we need. I have a question about the phone technology you mentioned and what apps that might have been or so forth. Okay. Then we had one more right up here. Thank you, by the way, to the runners for the microphone. I'm getting my exercise today. <laughs> Who was it? Right there. I have a question. How did you help your children cope with your husband? That's where I am right now. Okay. I think. We need a repeat. We need a repeat to the one that she was getting. Okay. Who? I think it was that woman in the white sweater. A question to Rick? A question to Rick. Oh, okay. How did his denial, if you will, manifest itself? Is that, a, is that a fair paraphrasing of your question? I didn't hear you. Uh, I would say, how did his denial, if you will, kind of manifest itself, and how do we deal with it? Yes, exactly. Okay. Do we have six questions, or am I counting wrong? Five. Well, there's one more right there. My dopamine is going. <laughs> <laughs> We're very early into our diagnosis with our mom just in May. She's 83 years old, very intelligent woman, very put together, very dignified. Um, but she has trouble communicating concepts and ideas. And my sister and I were wondering if it's disrespectful to aid them completing sentences. And is there a way to tell if they're really looking for that completion? Or should we allow her to belabor and struggle with her communication? Thanks, folks. I think we have six. Thank you very much, Vaughn. Terrific job. <laughs> Jeez. 
Executive Vice President of Technology. <laughs> ah, excellent. Ready to go. So my purpose in doing this is because I've been to some panel discussions before where we end up with the first panelist doing 40 minutes and then 15 minutes and then five minutes and I want to <laughs> make sure that we get all of this expertise and all of this expertise on board. So, um, who should we start with? Pat, how do you, what do you wish you had done early, early on that you didn't do? Okay. It's a good question and I gather that a number of you are, who are here uh, are dealing with the early, early diagnosis of PD rather than being where I am. Uh, I, I guess the thing that we would have changed, we were very lucky. Uh, we, we had a number of really good years before things try, started to slow down. But I don't think we really spent enough time thinking about what the future was going to be and cramming more good things into those years. And so I, I'd say if you have a bucket list or you don't, you might want to list on, those, on that bucket list what you think you ought to be doing uh, now for both of you. And also... Uh, to be sure that you uh, uh, spend time uh, figuring out and planning what you want to do as a caregiver as the process continues. Because you could wake up one day or one hour in one day and suddenly you're in the next stage of the disease and you didn't realize it was coming. Because it's, it's very chaotic and, and, and there's a sinusoidal curve that says at 9 o'clock in the morning he or she may be working, uh, operating very, very well and by one o'clock, they can't get out of a chair. And so it's, it's really good just to plan and, and, and make sure you, you keep yourself whole while dealing with the disease. Get the help you, you need, learn how to delegate those things you can, um, figure out ways to get done those things you can't. But, but do it early and then, then, then uh, it should, things should be better, although they won't be perfect. Follow-up question? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay, terrific, thank you. So I struggle with the idea of asking friends for help when they're so busy with whatever's going on in their lives. That, that, well, that is a struggle to ask for help. I find it very difficult to do that because my, my background, and my, I was raised to be you know, independent, and, you know, and that's the thing that was, was drummed into me as a child, and so I try to do that now. Uh, but... Actually, when you ask for help and you accept it, you give a gift to the person who offered the help that you don't realize that, that you've done. Um, it, it's always a gift. And, 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 but, but the thing you have to do with that is uh, quite often someone will say, hey, I'll, I'll go uh, to the grocery store for you uh, because that'll make your life easier. When, in fact, I'd rather they come and visit with my husband so I could go to the grocery store. I, I hate grocery shopping, but I'd be out of the house. <laughs> So we need to figure out how to tailor those things. But, but it, yeah, you, you got to ask them for help. And, and you also need to figure out ways to get professional folks to come into the house if, if you can make that work as well. Delegating things to others is a wonderful thing. I just have one side story. About three weeks ago, we just moved into a smaller place. And I needed some shelving in the basement to hold the things that wouldn't fit into the kitchen. And so I asked my husband's niece if she would help. And so she and her husband went off for two, two weekends and got all the shelving and pounded it together in the basement and put it in place. The gentleman I'm speaking of is a partner in a very high-powered law firm, so that was kind of fun. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on to Rick's, uh, one of his questions. How did his denial manifest itself? Well, I should uh, probably give a little more background. Um, uh, my sister is a medical doctor, and I was working in the Parkinson space. My sister was local in Seattle, where my parents are, or where my mom still is, my dad was. Uh, my parents met on a blind date in high school, been together ever since. So they had a level, uh, an adoring level of codependency, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's in the room, by the way, so she's going to smack me for this later. Um, so my sister and I were a little bit of the outsider and their relationship was tighter between the two of them than I think it, it was between us and, and my, my dad or, or, or with her. Uh, and it was really, I think, their decision jointly to not confront the mortality issue. 
Um, and it, it seemed to be like a conscious decision. She might be able to add more color to it later. Uh, I know it was very frustrating for my sister and I because um, you know, we would say, hey, it's, we really should be looking at hospice options at this point. You know, after the, the fall started, mm -hmm. and with a, once you, with Parkinson's typically, once you're admitted into a hospital, it's rare that you get back out. And he, he made it out a couple times, but then stuck. And he really didn't want to die in a hospital. He didn't want to spend any time in a hospital. He didn't want to be in a hospital. And I kind of took the advocacy role, ad, ad, the role as his advocate to get him out. And I had to kind of push a little bit and, and strain um, some relationships. And everyone all had just good intentions. Um, but uh, it was, even with, you know, we had kind of every advantage. Someone in the Parkinson's space, a medical doctor in the family, um, financial resources, and it was still a very, very tough thing to go through. Uh, I think the trip my sister organized to get him out before he couldn't get out, take him that, on that trip to where he grew up, was probably the best thing that we ever did for him in his later stages, so I really thank her for that. My only advice would be to pick some stuff like that. Like I said, worst you ever felt, best you ever gonna feel again, so today's the day. Go do it. Any, fo any follow-up to that? Questions? because it's hard to live in it all the time, every moment. So, I mean, I always kind of temper my husband's, you know, partial denial and, and then recognizes other things. But I think, you know, for their own, um, you know, to, yeah, self-esteem and to keep going, that a certain amount is, is not a bad thing. Yeah, we didn't try and ram it down his throat and we try to be respectful of their wishes, which was sometimes act like it wasn't there. Okay. Julie, we need, to, we need you to elaborate on this daily list uh, scheduling idea. I'd be happy to. Um, so it all came about because I was uh, working and with the kids and the needy dog um, really wasn't <laughs> able to accomplish. And I have a, a tremendous support system, uh, a lot of family in the, in the surrounding areas, and I tapped into all that, and I just felt like he really needed to you know, do something in the household. So I started out with more complex tasks and realized such as paying the bills online. And I'll never forget, and this is like five years ago, and um, I, n I noticed I was starting to get massive checks in the mail because he was overpaying like $700, $800. And I'm like, uh-oh. So, you know, then you start to realize he's probably not capable of paying the online bills, even though in his mind he is. So then I took that task off and replaced it with go get the mail, you know, and, and so frankly, it depends on the stage of where your loved one is that the task has to really fit with what their capacity to do things are when they can still feel accomplished at the end of the day. Like he'll say, I did your list. And sometimes he doesn't do my list and that's not a happy day for me, but... Um, <laughs> I also learn to understand that, and sometimes he's, he suffers from tremendous depression, apathy, and anger. He's in um, what I would say complete denial, so it's, it's very difficult for us um, you know, to manage through that. But, so the list has become a, a way for me, too, to say, see, you did three things today. A lot of times making dinner, which is now getting a little scary. Yeah, because, you know, I don't want the house to burn down. So, but I go through a service where I pick up um, frozen meals that are healthy because he was, you know, ordering pizza five times a week, um, <laughs> which the kids love. And they're really excited I'm out of town, by the way. <laughs> like, a little go, respite for them. Yeah, I go, <laughs> what'd you have for dinner? And my, my daughter just said guests, and I said pizza. <laughs> and so they've had it for three days. Um, <laughs> But those are the things you give up to. You just say, at least they're eating, you know. <laughs> my, sta my standards have dropped considerably. <laughs> um, but that's, so the list for me is a way to, you know, have some kind of communication with him so he feels like he's contributing to the household. But it is, basically it's stuff. You know, laundry, he, he does do laundry and folds, so that's good. We just can't get it into drawers and refold and things. I don't know if that, anyone else has that problem, but I feel like I'm perpetually doing laundry. Um, so those are the types of things that are on the list. Follow up? Anyone? Question? Ooh, two of them. 
you know, trademark the list. Just, you know, I was just wondering, you know, you make these little lists for them, and they're pretty simple to do, and you could do them yourself in about two minutes, but they, they take such a long time. But do you find that fatigue is a real big problem with them? Absolutely. Fatigue, yeah. I don't know. I know in the last session, um, oh, I'm sorry. Is fatigue a big problem? So you have a list, and can they get through it? And like I said, some days he doesn't get through it, and I just accept he's been napping and did what he needed to do. Um, but we actually, in the last session, he has uh, was diagnosed with sleep apnea. And now that he got the CPAP machine, he's actually better during the day, and we adjusted meds. So don't just think they have to be sleepy all day, because my neurologist really went after that and made sure we can get him as you know awake as possible. Um, so there might be some other underlying things. He also has low testosterone. And that was some. It wasn't a Parkinson's doctor diagnosis. It was a urologist. So that tied into um, and, you know depression and low um, energy. Believe it or not. So don't just believe that's the way life has to be. I would really speak with your doctors and keep asking for answers. Right there. I think our husbands were separated at birth. Really? <laughs> Do you want Mary? No, no, thank you. I don't know. Are you a Trekkie? It might be. He a is a Trekkie. So is mine. Oh, my God. <laughs> Maybe that's the common denominator. Um, well, the reason I had asked about it is scheduling is mine has the cognitive disability. If, and he loves his video games. Yep. So um, if I give him a list of three things, he'll play video games for eight hours and then the last five minutes of the day rush around. Yes. That's yeah. It, yeah. And I quite, I, I found that tiring to schedule his day every day. <laughs> and so I was yeah. part of my question, which I didn't phrase before is, you know, do you do the list literally on a daily basis or do you plan it ahead? Because when I planned it ahead, I just, it got away from me. Yeah, I do do it on a daily basis. Sometimes there's, you know, one or two things. Sometimes there's four. Like when I left, um, you know, it's, I've been gone, for, I'll be gone four days, which is a big deal. And I had to make sure everything was lined up. My kids are now, I have twins that are now 17. And I have a 13, 14 year old girl. And we call it tumble patrol. Uh, so they're on tumble patrol so dad doesn't fall um, over the weekends. But then during the week, I have some neighbors coming in and things like that for dinners. Um, but yeah, I mean, I again, I'm, now it's a habit for me. And it seems to work. Um, I just literally put one word down, two words down. I do it before I leave for work. So I get the kids ready in the morning, breakfast, get them off to school, I write the list, and then I go. So it's just a habit for me and seems to work for our family. And we had one more follow-up there. Where? Oh, right up here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I, we have five children, and so I've been a taskmaster. Master, I've had a lot of experience at it, so I make a list for my husband too. Okay. And one other thing that's in addition to that is one of the things that was very tiring for me to travel with him mm -hmm. is that he could not remember everything yeah. to take because he has medication that yeah. he has to do it daily. And mm -hmm. anyway, he's met a planner. Anyway, I had him make a list of everything that he needed to go on a trip. And it's working really well. Oh, that's, that's good. That's great. In fact, yeah. I need it because I forgot all my hair products. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> Lists are good. Okay. If so I, these, last, these last three questions. Oh, did you? And I, I just wanted to interject yeah. one thing. The only list I've made, or the only uh, prop I've made for my husband, which is a different thing, is a way to remember meds. He takes meds six times a day. One is in the middle of the night, so that he doesn't have uh, with him. But we, he has a, uh, an iPhone with alarms on it, and we have uh, three different pill boxes. One he carries around for the daytime pills, and then there's a separate one for the morning and a separate one for those before bed. And that seems to work really well. The, uh, the, uh, the, the alarm prompts him, and then he pulls the, the pills out of his pocket and takes them when he needs to. That's what we do, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Oh, one more. Just, uh, just a comment. Uh, you were talking about the iPhone. Well, the iWatch works as well. Oh, yes, right. And it yeah. works independently from an iPhone, and it means that the, that the reminder is always on the wrist. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a good idea. And there, w there was a, a wrist uh, phone or something like that earlier, and there was also an alarm in a pillbox. But at the moment, he just has the phone. But we'll think about the watch. I'm curious to know if anybody has found any kind of program where if they don't take their, if they have to take their meds every four hours, you're talking about med reminders, uh, sometimes our morning starts at six in the morning and of course he's not going anywhere until he's got his meds on board so he starts those at six. Other times he manages to sleep in until eight. Well, his every four hours doesn't start till he takes that first medication, which means I can't just set one set of alarms for every day. And so it either means I have to stop and set in all the alarms every day. Has anyone found a program anywhere that you can like push the time you took your first med and it automatically counts out every four hours? We don't do that. He, he, his alarms are the same time every day. And if he's asleep, I wake him up. And we're going to discuss apps. That's one of the questions here in a bit. So if you don't mind, we're going to move on to another question. And these last three seem much more general. So I'm going to open it up to any of the panel members that want to uh, discuss it. But also, anybody out there that has an answer to this question as well, please share the wealth. So children came into the conversation, and I'm going to generalize this question a bit. How do you talk to children, including adult children, because this can be quite traumatic for them, uh, about a loved one's diagnosis? Anybody want to start? Um, for me, my children were very young when Dave was diagnosed, and uh, they were two, and the twins were about five. Um, so they really haven't known him without Parkinson's. Um, and so what I've decided to do is, um, as they grew older and started to see him deteriorate, I have very frank conversations, but it's different. I take the boys, I took them out to lunch and, you know, talk to them about some of the uh, cognitive things that were happening. Because, again, the tremors they can see, and he's had two DBSs, so he actually looks and not, doesn't tremor that much. So for him, them, they don't understand why this is so difficult. Why is dad not working? Why doesn't he do anything? Why does he sit around for it's eight hours or 12 hours doing the same thing over and over? So really having frank conversations, but I've frankly left out some of the more uh, challenging discussions such as addictive behaviors. Uh, that was part of our life as well, but I just think it would change their perception of him. So I've made a choice not to tell them yet, um, maybe sometime in the future, but still their dad, so I want to keep it you know, as open and honest as possible, but I think for my family, I'm going to hold off on some of the more, you know, tricky conversations where they might pass judgment, frankly, and they don't know the whole, they just can't comprehend the whole story yet. We would love to hear comments and stories from the audience. Right there. I, uh, what we found is, is by immediately that we had the diagnosis, we shared that with the adult, uh, the adult children and with the grandchildren and uh, have made a point of uh, if there's something significant from the neurologist, uh, we call them and let them know. So they're a part of it. They don't help very much in the caregiving, but they know what's going on. So there's no surprises. And with the grandchildren, you know, they ask about the shaking of the hand, and we just tell them what it is. When they ask the question, we answer it in, what, in the most honest, simple way that we can. But I think that it's important to uh, let or ensure that the family, do what you can to ensure that the family understands the progression, and so there's no surprises. It's, about, it's building trust, too. Mm -hmm. Being an advocate. Mm -hmm. Right over here. Uh, so my husband is 74. He was diagnosed 10 years ago. And at the point of diagnosis, his preference was we, we have adult children. We sort of met individually with them to give them this terrible news. And then a few months in, though, we convened a meeting of, we did not, well, the grandchildren at the time were babies, so that wasn't really relevant then. But of the adult children, we literally sat around our dining room table and we presented a list to them of every symptom that he had, because some of them, you, he didn't ever have tremor, but some of them, you know, you can't see. And our overall message was, this is not, there's nothing in this that is secret. 
So any questions you ever have or anything you want to know or anything that we want to come to you with, you know, it's kind of an open exploration. I, I think that was good for us. It was turning good for my husband. And, you know, he and I at that time were going in and out of denial like mad. But it helped us to really focus on what we were dealing with. And then one cute story, the little grandson who was the oldest, when he was four, I was kind of waiting for a time, huh, what do we talk, how do we talk to the little four-year-old about this? So we're getting in a car to go somewhere, and my husband's taking a long time. In fact, I think he got in the car and then had to go back in the house for something really slow. And little Zach is in the back, and he says, Nana, why is Granddad so slow? So I thought, well, there's the question. So I said to him, well, Zach, Granddad has a disease. It's called Parkinson's. And part of Parkinson's is it makes you really slow. And Zach said, who's the most empathetic little creature on the face here, said, oh, Nana, am I gentle enough with Granddad? Oh, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Follow up to that comment, if you don't mind sharing. Uh, emotions in the adult children, how, how were those? Immediate? Delayed? They, well, <laughs> many of them were seeing symptoms for quite a while, including a daughter-in-law who said to me months before, I really, we really think that dad has Parkinson's, to which I said, oh, no, it's the, you know, whatever, that was in my denial. So they, they weren't real surprised, and... And, and yet, you know, there were tears, and it was hard. It was, you know, for all of us. So there, there were a lot of emotions expressed about how hard it's going to be, and none of us really knew how hard it was going to be at that time. But, yeah. Okay, we'll go here. Um, the whole denial thing is something that we've really struggled with because I've known for years that something was wrong with my husband, um, with decision making and different a lot of the different cognitive things but when I would talk I have five grown children and when I would talk to a couple of the oldest ones they basically would just all kind of make fun of me oh that's mom thinks you know there's something wrong with dad and so it's been he's finally got a diagnosis but they've still all been really slow to actually acknowledge that that's what is going on until it starts affecting them and then you know when he's dealing with them in a way he never would have then I found that that's when I can say, you know what, don't take this personally. This is what I'm telling you. This is what I've been talking about. You know, he, he's not quite himself in, in every area. And the fact that he doesn't really want to totally accept it either. He'd rather think I'm just getting older or, you know, he's only 59. So it just, I, I don't know. That's all I have to say. Well done. Thank you. Then way in the back there. Well, I... When my husband was first diagnosed, he actually did fairly well with the accepting part of it, but he wasn't sure how much he wanted to share yet until he kind of processed it for a while. And then he sat down and wrote a letter that kind of took each of the more common symptoms that he felt he might be facing, identified them for people, and... Um, kind of made suggestions on what they might be able to do to help him with those issues uh, and, and wrote it up in a letter to dear family and friends. And then those people that he was really close to, he sent that to them. And he, that was kind of his way of notifying people of what was going on in his life, including his own children. Uh, but one of the things he needed the comfort of when you're talking about uh, emotions was apparently there are I mean, we know there are different kinds of Parkinson's. Some are uh, run in families, and some are what they call spontaneous, and he had no idea because of his family being adopted what his was running. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with 23andMe, but they have a wonderful Parkinson's uh, program, I guess. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, but they offered for free to do um, DNA testing to identify maybe how his manifested and it was a huge relief for him to know that he it, his was a spontaneous and that he didn't have that to to feel like he was passing on to his kids but his feeling was if it was the other he would have been able to let them know what kinds of things to watch for so it didn't sneak up on them like it did on him so either way he was prepared 
Thank you. And right here. I have a great book for um, like um, 17 years and up, and it's called, and I didn't write it, uh, it's called My Degeneration, A Journey Through Parkinson's by Peter Dunlop Scholl, and it's a graphic novel. You can basically get through it in two days, and it's funny, it's sarcastic, but it also explains all, a lot of the symptoms. My 17-year-old read it, and then all of a sudden he could understand why his dad has no facial features. It was the first time he really learned about the mask. So all of a sudden, after reading this book, very short and easy, funny and sad, um, he could then identify uh, more of the symptoms that you might not necessarily. I think it's a really great book. And then the other thing I've done as a caregiver, sometimes I need to get away. And I've asked my kids who can volunteer to watch dad for, you know, two or three days. And that's how they learn really what the symptoms and what, and what you're doing and have a kind of a better appreciation um, of how hard it is. And, um, and they only have to do it for two or three days, so. Ooh, over here. I just want to comment that it's always great in a group when we find the golden topic. I think we've gotten here. <laughs> yes. Another book uh, available on Amazon uh, written by a local woman whose father had, has Parkinson's. Her name is Marcy Jones, and the book is Grandpa, What is Parkinson's? It's That's a, a very, book. It's a very simple way to explain to small children why grandpa isn't exactly right. So one more over here. Vaughn, how much time I would do we have? like to ask for some advice on how to deal with Parkinson's uh, husband who knows he has Parkinson and he will make it as an excuse not to do something which he can <laughs> do it for himself. <laughs> And the other thing is, uh, I think I discovered he has Parkinson two years. Uh, I mean, he was diagnosed Parkinson two years ago. But actually, I noticed some symptoms much earlier. But it was not diagnosed. But only two years ago. And then um, from this year onward, I discovered he was so hooked up with the internet, with the IT thing, you no. Know? And every day he would be sweeping his handphones, computers, and no conversations with any other members of the family. So I really don't know how to deal with the situation because when we talk to him, he seems to listen, but actually it doesn't go in. <laughs> and, and after that, you remind him that I have told you this thing, and he said, oh, did you? I don't know. You didn't tell me. So this is the question, uh, things which I really f would like to have some advice on how to deal with it. Any, any advice for impulse control around the internet? Yeah, no Maripex. Yeah. Maripex is a, yeah. uh, uh, so Maripex is a, a drug and you're, mm -hmm. you're, you know, there's a lot of passionate uh, people, not a fan of Maripex. Uh, for my husband, it was what caused the addictive behaviors that almost mm -hmm. crushed our entire family. So just, it's do it doesn't work like that for everyone, so consult your doctor. Please don't, you know, take them off Mar your, your person off of Maripex, but just be very, very watchful. So that might be one of the things, I don't know if your husband's on Maripex. Um, the other drug is Ropinerol, Ropen is another drug that does the same thing. Question right here. Did you raise your hand again? Right here. Oh, and over there. You're number two. 
<laughs> Can I make a quick comment on the medicines before she starts? Because we're moving into medical territory again here. All the drugs they're talking about, plus the new propatch, are dopamine agonist. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you wouldn't want to think that's the only cause of impulse behaviors. It exaggerates that. But there's something about the dopamine chemistry that and, and replacement therapy with levodopa that makes people a little happier and a little more compulsive. So, and if you need to watch that, you can come to my house. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and one, one other thing with that, uh, talk, talk to your neurologist about it because the ropinerol input came from the neurologist. This is happening, why is it happening? Uh, this is the drug in this particular case that's causing the problem. So your neurologist is the key. And right there. A suggestion with regard to um, uh, use of the computer, uh, I like to think about how do you modify the environment, and so just uh, make sure that the computer isn't plugged in. <laughs> just Good point. I'm just asking a question here. Which I wanted to go back to the question um, the other woman asked, which I think is kind of the opposite of how did the denial manifest itself, which was how did when they're taking, taking advantage, so to speak, of the Parkinson's diagnosis. So I was wondering if our panel or some other folks could comment on that. That's a great question. Long before my dad had Parkinson's, he had a master's degree in engineering from UC Berkeley. He worked on the Apollo command module. He was incapable of using the washing machine. <laughs> I don't have any good advice for you. <laughs> yeah, I think we're hesitant because it's 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 really a tough question. Um, I call it the get out of jail free card uh, that he flips on every to now and you know I asked you to do that I don't remember and I didn't yeah. I can't I can't do that mm -hmm. but yet he can get to Starbucks which is what he really wants to do and sit there for hours and hours listening to book on tape that's his compulsion is book on tape mm -hmm. and so you know I'll, I'll confront him about it but it just is a it's a vicious circle and just upsets me mm -hmm. so I've decided just to why debate it so whether it's the Parkinson's or whether it's his denial or the doctor always asks me then what does it matter I'm like, true. So it is, <laughs> but I want to fix it. <laughs> I'm a fixer. And the other side of this issue is the person who continues to believe he can do all the things he did before his physical symptoms came, came about. And he, he, can't, he can't do things like, he can't do, uh, his fine motor skills are not what they used to be, and his ability to pound a nail and carry lumber and those kinds of things he liked to do to rearrange this basement I've been talking about. He's still trying to do and uh, doesn't always want to either, he definitely doesn't want to delegate, is not always uh, uh, open to uh, getting help to help him do that. And I know he's off somewhere listening to this, so he's heard me say this today. <laughs> <laughs> being taped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when you talk about um, your husband wrapping himself up in the computer and using it as an excuse not to do things. I would wonder about depression also. Um, that's pretty common and those, I would think that would be something that might be worth looking into. So has anyone successfully seen that diminished with antidepressants? Mm. I have seen that uh, greatly um, for my husband, when he got on the antidepressants, he came back to a lot to whom he was before he was, after he was diagnosed. He was, he was very depressed before he was diagnosed, and then after he was diagnosed. And um, he heard that depression is a part of Parkinson's, and it gave him the freedom to get on the antidepressants. And he is a much, much more back to who he was, and he's able to focus. Um, he, he tells all the kids a lot that he loves them. He's realized basically where he is in the disease. 
he was much easier for him to um, start using the his walker. I could tell him, your walker guarantees you a seat when we go somewhere. And for him, <laughs> that was a life changer <laughs> because he couldn't always just go find a chair to sit in because he had trouble standing. And so for him, um, he asked the doctor for them. And it was life-changing. It changed our entire dynamics of our family. Thank you for that. Anybody else with uh, stories about antidepressants? Comments? Okay, so let's, let's move on. Uh, how do you tell if the person is waiting for help or just needs more time? Another thing we did, I think you need to ask the person and get their feedback. We also met with a social service agency in the last year who took us through an exercise of talking about core values and how they are going to impact your future needs. And it was very eye-opening. We went through an exercise where each of us separately ranked a list of tasks, put them in priority order, and then we compared the priorities of each one. And I was totally off base of what his priorities were. And one of them is, was about dressing yourself. And that was one of his highest priorities, that when the time comes, he wants to dress himself. And I was astounded. <laughs> I said, do you mean even if it takes you 45 minutes to button your shirt? And he said, yes. One right behind you there. Thank you. My dad um, doesn't speak a lot anymore because he's just kind of internalized himself. But when he does speak, he's very soft-spoken and he breaks between his thought in a single sentence. I'm trying to teach my family, my husband's one of the worst, that you have to wait for grandpa to be able to finish. So I wanna teach them how to look at him so that they can focus and see because if they're not, they might drift on his thought and I've watched the sadness in his face as he's not being heard. And so that's something I'm really working hard to teach all of my family because he's just shutting down. Nobody can let him finish a sentence. It's very wise of you. Who, whoever put their hand up first. The part of the Parkinson's, it's the first, I have a, my husband and my father has it. Um, my husband's voice was diminishing and he actually had saline implants put in and a few months later his voice was back to being low again he was losing it and that's when they referred him to the neurologist and the Parkinson's diagnosis came after that my dad has it he's got a lot of cognitive decline and his voice is very weak but he can sing really well and he loves to sing um, the other thing is there's the loud program mm -hmm. yeah. loud I'm sure some yeah. of you have heard LSVT of it LSVT loud right mm -hmm. and um I'm trying to encourage my husband to go through it because he still is really sharp and he's in good physical condition other than the, you know, the decline of the Parkinson's, but he's always been an exerciser and very athletic. So I'm encouraging him to take it. But my dad, it's too late for him because the physical therapist said that, or the occupational therapist, speech therapist said that he wouldn't retain it in order to repeat it. When, if he gave him a list of a tasks that to do when he left, he wouldn't be able to do it. But I don't know at what point your dad's at, but even singing, they, he can sing. My dad can sing and he can barely talk. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I sat at church and listened to my dad sing, which he doesn't do very often. He usually sleeps through it. And uh, <laughs> the few times that he has sung in the last few months brought tears to my eyes because I don't know how long I'll hear that. Mm -hmm. But he still can. The, the LSVT program, the LOUD program, is very worthwhile. The most important thing with it, though, is that the patient needs to be encouraged to do it at home when they come home. 
and in my experience with more than one Parkinson patient, uh, they tend to be lax about that, just as the rest of us exercise programs tend to be put on the back burner. But if you, if you can help them do that program on a regular basis, their voice will be so much better. I had a question. Um, right? Right here. Oh. My <laughs> husband's voice is very low mm -hmm. right now, barely audible. And so, like you brought up, when he, um, when we're in a group of a few people, even like four or five people, they're coming over for dinner, I can also see in his eyes every single time he tries to inject, nobody hears him and they just speak over him. Mm -hmm. And so I'm experimenting with different things like, oh, dad, dad wants to say something or Michael mm -hmm. wants to say something. I kind of, and everybody looks and... I was wondering if anybody else had any suggestions. I'm not sure if I'm, if that's like a good thing to do to kind of, and often it I'm is, even yeah. stopping people because they're just mulling over. Mm -hmm. I mean, just going right over his head. Mm -hmm. If anybody else had that. It, what you're doing is a good thing. Uh, to, they get, to get people to slow down, let, let the patients speak, let them be part of the conversation. Otherwise, they'll fade into the background. My husband had a very booming voice. He wouldn't need this microphone in this room, but today he, he has the same issue your husband has. So keep doing what you're doing and encourage the rest of the people who come to dinner to, to help him have his turn. Anybody yeah. here whose loved one uses a voice amplifier? Um, no, I was just going to say what you just mentioned about interjecting. That's my husband's neuropsychologist had told me I need to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't have a voice problem. He has the processing, the, the bradyphrenia, where it, it, he's a little bit slower. And when I see the look in his eyes, you know, I will, I have no problem interrupting people. <laughs> and I'll say, you know, I'll ask my husband, did, you know, was there something you wanted to say or did you want to respond to this? And because, that's part of us being there. And I have had friends that I've kind of taken aside and said, mm, you know, Scott would like to participate more and if you could just pay a little bit more attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have just a few minutes left. Let's get this question down front. In the support group that we started uh, going to with mom, um, everyone is allowed their three to five minutes to speak. And it, I don't care if they get out three sentences in that five minutes. But I, I noticed since I started going, when everybody has a chance to speak, I noticed the guys get a little sparkle in their eye. It doesn't matter how long it takes. But my specific question was, in someone with more cognitive issues, you, they're, they're discussing, they're trying to discuss a topic and they're, they're struggling for that word. Maybe they want to tell you about the dog, but they can't get the word dog out. How do people feel about helping them with their conversation? That's what we're having trouble with with mom. We don't know whether to assist her with the proper words when she looks at us or should we let her struggle to pull that word out? It's not about her volume or her or disorientation or taking too much time to speak. It's, it's, it's grabbing that information and, and sometimes it's obvious what she's trying to say, but sometimes it isn't. And we just don't know whether to intervene or not. It's kind of difficult. Like she's giving you a cue. I was going to ask, which one makes her happier? Can you tell? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, two more questions and we have to wrap up. Um, one thing we found with my husband was... Um, my husband is a psychologist. He has always had a very extensive vocabulary, always able to, um, you give him a word and he can give you just a very precise use and definition. But he was finding that he was struggling to find words and actually thinking he might have to um, quit practicing. Um, he did the loud part of big and loud and what he found was once he worked on the mechanics of speech and being able to sustain a deep breath and get the volume out. It was like it freed up that part of his brain and he can now find the words again because he's not focusing all of his attention on how am I going to physically get the word out. So 
again, another you know good plug for the loud part of um, Big and Loud. Okay. One more question. My husband has Parkinson's, and he uh, he has the same problem. It's the processing time. He, he does have problems with the volume, and he did do the loud program, but the processing time. So he has told me to help him with a word. Like if I can figure out what he's doing, I put the one word out there, and that's I try not to. I try to be very respectful, but just sometimes triggering one word will get the whole rest going. So we're out of time. We didn't get to apps. Vaughn, how long do you have this room? How long is this room available to us? Okay. So first of all, round of applause for the panel. <laughs> and please give yourselves a round of applause. So after the last speaker, please feel free to hang around, share the apps that we didn't get to talk about, share whatever secrets and tricks that you have with other people, network, get to know people, trade emails, all of that. Thank you very much. And thank you to Tony. And now, back and better than ever,